Passover is over. Yes. <laughs> we didn't pass over, but it's over. <laughs> and because time moves on, we passed the third day. Anyone know why that's significant? I'm here and he arose. He arose. That's our resurrection of the sacrificed lamb. We can't miss that. But we've moved on on our calendar. And as has already been said, we're moving towards Shavuot. We're counting the Omer. And it is day 10, which is one week and three days. That's how we'll always phrase it. We'll give it in that format. So I have to ask you. Is it back to business as usual? No. No? no. <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, last year we spent a lot of time counting the Omer. Right. We looked at it many different ways, saw how we should count. I'm not going to bring you the same thing again, but I'm going to tell you that the Omer makes us look to the future with hope. Amen. And I think that's what we really need. Amen. Right now. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's our people are saying, really? How is Israel to look to the future with hope right now in these world conditions? How? Some of us have the answer. Do you know what this Sunday is on the calendar? Yom HaShoah. It's the day of remembrance of the Holocaust. And just like Pesach this year was different, we had that extra empty seat. We had that hole in our heart. We look at Yom Hoshoah in a new light also. Rochelle, it's, there is going to be a day of remembrance at UCR for people that want to go to it uh, on Sunday at 3, 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon yes. at UC Riverside in yes. Palm Desert. So there's Palm gonna, yeah. yeah, in Palm Desert. Yeah, there's going to be a celebration. <coughs> so you, you see Riverside Palm Desert yes. right. location. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. At 3 p.m. Right. And uh, I only know of uh, the, the Roth World Outreach Center in San Bernardino has an Israeli speaking who survived October 7th. Oh, wow. And wow. the Sunday night service is going to honor the memories and, and what is going on. And uh, I'm sure anyone's welcome if they want to make the trek all the way up to where I live. <laughs> but uh, it, it, we hold our traditions. We hold and value these days. There's a reason behind it. There's, there's more than one reason behind it. But I do just have to say, and I have to take it, you know, you'll know, you'll recognize it. We hold on and we go on and we move in our traditions, even if our lives are as shaky as a fiddler on the roof. <laughs> but he said it so well that there's just no better way to say it. And we know that October 7th was the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And the great horror of it, the question is still being asked and, and unfortunately one day will have to be answered, but the great horror of it is how could it happen on Israeli soil? That's the clincher. And as I say, there are those that survived it. Um, I don't believe the one that I will be hearing is, but there were some who survived the Holocaust who now are survivors of October 7th also. Wow. And that's just heart-wrenching. They say over 2,500 that lived through the Holocaust have been touched in some way from a loss of a home or a loss of a life. But this is not something we can take lightly, and we can't just go about business as usual. But we do go on. It's the story of our people. I, I'm sorry to say it, because it's not uplifting, but it's true. It's the history of our people. And we have to continue, because that's what God has for us to do, is to continue on. So even though it's not familiar territory, and even though I can hear Tevia once again, God would like us to be joyful even when our hearts lie panting on the floor. <laughs> and this is where we are right now. But many people are asking, where do we go from here? How do we go on? What are we going to do? Our extreme Chabadniks are in a period of 50 days of denial. The, the days we count Omer, they're denied. There's no celebrations. There's nothing joyful. They, some won't even play music. 
Sorry, folks. I'm glad we're not among them. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Look Amen. what we enjoyed tonight. But they think that they're earning their steps up toward the holiness and the sanctification that God wants of them by denying themselves, getting themselves ready to receive the word of God because 50 days from Pesach was when God gave on Mount Sinai his word to the people, his commandments and his law. And that to them is what Shavuot is all about. Bruce told you what we see in it. And we'll bring the two together, you'll see the fullness of it. But these who are so sincere to try to earn that way with God are missing something. They're missing something past and present, let alone the future. We can't forget our past. Forgetfulness leads to exile. And we can't forget our present because that would only lead to more atrocities. And that's what you're hearing from Israel right now. But we cannot forget our future either. We've been given what our future is. It's given to us in God's word. Yes. It's given to us with his promise. Yes. It's given to us so we know he has planned a future for Israel and it will happen. Amen. Amen. That's the future, the hope of Israel. And when you know that, then you ask yourself, okay, then how do we live in accordance with that? What do we do? How is this personal to us? Because God didn't just write it for a generation later or a generation previous, he wrote it for us. Mm -hmm. And he intends for us to be interacting with him. Mm -hmm. That's why Tevye got that right. Mm -hmm. Talking to God all day long is the way we all should be. Mm -hmm. But what is the future? What is the hope? Our scripture tells without a vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. And I'm still haunted by the, the, the eyes of the woman I saw in the rally down here in the desert mm -hmm. who was so fearful for Israel's future, fearing that Israel will be wiped off of the map. And I try to assure her, no, I know. But it's not, doesn't matter what I know. It's our God, the God of Israel, who has told us. And in the Psalms, to Psalm, Tehillim Psalm 130 and verse 7, it says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Amen. Oh, name. It says it all. It says it all. It answers everyone and their questions. Death does surround us. In biblical times, we have it in our parsha. Our parsha starts off with the death of, of Nadab and Abahu because they were bringing strange fire before the Lord. They were not being obedient, and it cost them dearly. We have death through our scriptures. Okay, let's go past our scriptures and we look in our history books and what do we find? Death. Aren't I uplifting tonight? <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> because it is our very current headlines and there isn't any way we can escape it. So how do we keep on? And how do we hold on to hope? We've said what the hope is. The hope is in the Lord. The hope is in the God of Israel. Hope is in the God who birthed Israel in hope and then rebirthed her in hope again. And there's where I want to take you. I want you to see the bigger picture. I want you to see where we're moving. I want you to see that we're not earning brownie points with our God. But as we look to him, listen to him, follow him, and walk in what he has established, we will walk in hope and not in fear. Going all the way back, I have to take you back to Abraham because initially Abraham was called to leave home. All he was told was, go. go. We've got someone in the midst of moving in our group tonight. I think she can relate to this, but she knows where the move is going. Abraham didn't. He wasn't given a map. He wasn't given instructions that were all laid out. He was just simply told, go and I will show you. Mm -hmm. And he stepped out in that faith. He stepped out in the hope that he would find that land. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't have been easy. We know he even had trouble leaving some of his family. We see that. But God gave him a great promise in chapter 12 of Bereshit, mm -hmm. when God promised the blessings on Abraham, that, that he would bless those who bless them, curse those who curse them, and through him, through this nation, 
all the world would be blessed. God birthed this hope into, into Abraham's heart. But it's not, it doesn't stop there. And I want to show you how hard it was. Because we tend to read and it's not the same as when you live through it. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to read a bit for you. Because now we have Abraham at 99 years of age. Jim, he beats you. <laughs> but you give me new insight to 90s. <laughs> and may we all be like Jim when we're in our 90s. Amen. Amen. God spoke to Abraham at 99 years of age. It's recorded for us in chapter 17 of Bereshit. And I'll start with verse 1. I am El, El Shaddai. And we refer to God Almighty tonight. Bruce, you were on some of my notes. <laughs> but then we divided. We didn't walk in him. He, as, as he called out that he is El Shaddai, he is God Almighty, he said, walk in my presence and be pure-hearted. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will increase your numbers greatly. Think, okay? He's 99. His wife is 89. They don't have any little kidlets. There's no children of Israel, okay? This is it. And he's hearing God say, I'll increase your numbers greatly. Well, Abram fell on his face. And God continued speaking with him. He showed honor, he showed respect that his mind is going. And I know it's going because I know what he says. <laughs> it's not my, my reading in, it's there. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Avram, but your name will be Avraham, because I have made you the father of many nations. I will cause you to be very fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will descend from you. Well, by this point, he's got to be thinking, really? <laughs> really? Uh, I think we have a problem. Right in the get -go. Verse 7, God went on and said, I'm establishing my covenant between me and you, along with your descendants after you. Do you know what a descendant is? A descendant is a begat, okay? Can you read it in the scripture? <laughs> the descendants are coming from him, generation after generation, an everlasting covenant to be God for you and for your descendants after you. Wow, what? Wow, he's telling him. Not just I'm going to give you descendants, but I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. I will give you in your land, I'm sorry, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are now foreigners. Hello, Abraham, you're home. This is going to be your land. It's going to belong to your descendants and it's going to belong generation after generation Amen. after generation. And I say, world, yep. sit up yeah, and right. take notice. Amen. Amen. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> All the land of Canaan as a permanent possession and I will be their God well verse 9 God said to Abraham as for you 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 are to keep my covenant you and your descendants do you hear this again and again and do you think he knew Abraham was having a little bit of trouble with this and he's saying don't miss it don't miss it get this because he says you and your descendants after you generation after generation he's telling him you're not going to just have a son you're going to have a grandson and you're going to have a great grandson and it's going to go on and on and on and then he gives him the sign of circumcision and we all know wow what a sign this was so much meaning in there i'd have to stop and give you a whole lesson i hope you all know it if you don't talk to me later we'll, we'll do that another time but i want to pick up in verse 15 of the same chapter God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarai, your wife, you're now to call her Sarah. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. Did I hear you right, God? She's 89. Do you remember that, God? We've kind of gone past those days. And yet, he says, truly, I will bless her. She will be a mother of nations kings of people will come from her and at this Abraham fell on his face and he laughed and he thought to himself will a child be born to a man a hundred years old will Sarah give birth at 90 I, I can just hear really <laughs> this is mind-blowing 
and we just read by it. <laughs> no, we want to wake up and we realize God birthed hope in Abraham's heart. He brought him into a land. He was the foreigner in that land. He continued to look for the city that wasn't made with hands, but he never became a permanent citizen of this land. He was a nomad. He was a, a one who lived in the land, but he, God promised it to his descendants. But it was birthed in hope. I'm going to fast forward because I have to hurry. We have a clock. That's what's not in heaven. And we've got Abraham, and we've got his son, Yitzhak, Isaac, and we've got his grandson, Yaakov, Jacob. Do you know what they all did? They lived in the land, the land that God had promised. But still, it was just the land of promise. And it's going to be years later. We're going to go well over 400 years. We're going to hop over Pesach, and we're going to come to the time when God is bringing our people back to that land. And they're going to come back into that land because God is going to free them from slavery, yes, yes. from hostage-like conditions. Yes. And I cry out, oh my yes. God, do it again. Yes. Do it again. Yes. Do it again. So God uses much to free them from Pharaoh's grip. And now they're going to have shalom, right? <laughs> well, first they're going to face the Red Sea, the Egyptian army pursuing them. Pursuing them. I can't talk. Once they get past that with the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, they're still going to, to have the time, I'm just going to call it a forbidding time in the desert of Sinai, 40 years. And then it's shalom, right? <laughs> okay, then there's going to be battling. They're going to battle the well-fortified cities of the Canaanites that God has promised that he would kick them out of the land. And by the grace of God, as we move into the time of Yeshua, they begin to make this country their own. And you can say it, it's in spite of overwhelming odds, or as the videos are around today, against all odds. Sometimes it had have looked ridiculous and impossible to our people, but faith in God's word. And this is what I want us to take from this today too, because sometimes it does look ridiculous or hopeless or impossible or crazy or what? Am I hearing you right, God? But by faith, we listen and we obey. Think about them stepping right up and into the Jordan River. It is a rushing river. It needed to part also, and it didn't part till the priests stepped in, the ones who were carrying the ark, symbol of the presence of the Lord. Or how about the time when the whole people line up, get ready, march all the way around the walls. Don't say a word. Have you ever tried to keep people quiet? I don't know how that worked. <laughs> but they weren't to say a word. The trumpets blew. They followed the ark. The people followed. Had a whole entourage. And that whole city on the inside had to thought, what are they doing? Day one. Day two. Day three, and if I had time, I would dramatize it so you get the idea. By day seven, I'm sure the inhabitants of Jericho are laughing, are thinking, there's those fools again, they're out for their walk, you know, I hope it's doing them some good because this is crazy. And this day, they are told to go around once. God says go around seven times. The number of completion, the number of perfection, and on the seventh time, blowing the trumpets, and moving forward, now they are to shout. Yep. What do you think they shouted? Any ideas? Hallelujah. That's where I went. <laughs> hallelujah. You're the one who said hallelujah. That's where hallelujah. I went. In my mind, I think it was, it's on, hallelujah, and in the name of our God, they went forth and they conquered. I have no idea. We'll find out one day. Then I'll take you to another battle. And here we see the faith, because the leader said, Son, stand still. Is that exactly how he did it? He prayed for God to make the sun stand still. But you get my point. And the moon had to stay in its place. If you told the people that, well, 
genital understanding, they would say he was Michigana. <laughs> it was crazy, okay? Yet the river did part, and the walls did fall down, and the sun and the moon did halt. And do you realize that didn't throw everything out of orbit? The stars didn't fall, and everything, the axis of the earth, everything. I can't think of all the scientific things that should have happened, but none of them did. And they moved on. So now we get shalom, right? <laughs> I think you're smart enough. <laughs> no, not yet. We've got to walk through the times of the judges, the prophets, the priests. God gave them this. But the time of the judges was a cycle of rebellion and judgment, and it was repentance and repeat. Judgment and rebel I'm sorry, rebellion and judgment, repentance and repeat again and again and again and we've got priests that were less than admirable and we've got prophets some of them were outright false prophets they were not declaring the word of the lord think of Jeremiah's time he was the only one crying out telling them how it was really going to be and they took that so well they threw him in the pit that so well they took it yet in the midst of it all one common thing i see is god always gave hope. He gave hope in the midst of their storm, in the midst of their circumstances, just as he can do for us today. And even when they were exiled in disobedience out of that land of promise, we have the prophets Yeshahu, Yeremiah, Hezekiel, Micha. We have so many that told about coming judgment or in the judgment or how long the judgment would last, but notice that because they always taught about the fact it would come to an end, and out of God's grace, they would be restored. God never left them without hope. If this woman that I met at that rally knew her God, she would have had hope. That's what I had, that she didn't. And not because I'm someone, but my God is. Lamentations 2.19 says, Arise, whimper in the night. At the beginning of the night, watch us. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Raise your hands to him for the life of your little ones who's languishing because they're hungry. Can you imagine a parent watching their child starve? This was what they were going through because they had not been obedient. And yet, just a little past that lament, we have chapter 3, in verses 22 to 24. But in my mind, I keep returning to something, something that gives me hope, that the grace of Adonai is not exhausted. His compassion has not ended. On the contrary, they are new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. Adonai is all I have. Therefore, I say, I will put my hope in him. Israel, you need to put your hope in God. Israel always had grounds for hope. They didn't always exercise it. Many of them today are not exercising it, but they always had and have opportunity for that hope. And God does promise their return, and we do see they return them. And God has promised that there is one coming who will be a holy priest who will be the faithful prophet, actually the fulfiller of prophecy, one who will be the perfect king. You know what his name is? Yeah. Yeshua. 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 Mashiach. Jesus the Messiah. But first that king would come, and Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9, tells us, Rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Zion. Shout out loud, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous. He is victorious. Yet he is humble. He's riding on a donkey. Yes, on a lowly donkey's colt. Right there they were told, King Messiah, he's coming. But he's not coming as king. He's coming humble. He's coming as a servant. But also, they, God promised that this king would reign. And we have that in Zechariah also. Just the, the next verses. We were in 9, now we're just going to 10 through 12. It's right there. God never leaves them without that hope. I will banish chariots from Ephraim and war horses from Jerusalem. That means there's war in the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Jerusalem. The warrior's bow will be banished and he will proclaim shalom 
to the nations. Yes. Yerushalayim has never known that shalom. Then don't miss this. I mean, this just leapt off the page at me because of our, our history, what is going on right now, and I just, here comes a hallelujah. He will rule, don't miss it. He will rule from sea to sea, from the Euphrates rivers to the ends of the earth. And I say, Hamas and all your cohorts, did you hear that? From the river to the sea, all of Israel will be free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the hope of Israel. And it goes on, it says, also you by the blood of your covenant. Notice the blood of the covenant. I will release your prisoners from dungeons. And again, I thought of our hostages. Oh, yes. The cistern that has no water in it, and they'd thrown Yermia in a cistern that had no water. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners, with hope. Mm -hmm. There is hope. There is hope. Now, we know there's time, a long time, between that first coming and the second coming when he comes and rules and reigns and we know that we continue through their history and we see that their hope is, is their hope is bolstered it is by the, the prophecies that come from Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi and Ezra and Nehemiah and even with Ezra and Nehemiah we see the the glory of the rebuilding of a temple a restored temple and at that time our people had overcome their fears to build that temple to build it all around it but they did, in their weakness, cry out to their God. They did finish the project. I like that. They finished. Well, we've got to continue. We've got to move faster through the corridor of time because when we continue through Israel's history, and I have to ask you, okay, now do we get Shalom? Do I have fault? We've got good kings, but we've got bad kings. We've got division. We've got captivities. We've got the Hashemonian period. It was so corrupt, I can't even begin to cover that. We have the Romans replacing the Syrian Greeks as sovereign. That's our time of Hanukkah. We have the time of Yeshua, where we have tax collectors and the Roman authorities. And now they're appointing the kings, as in King Herod. And they are saying who can be a high priest. And they've got a heartless procurator by the name of Pilate and hope once again, is at a low, and rightfully so. They're living through this, politically, materially. The sheer pain of everyday life was their reality. This is our story. Yes. Second song, third verse, first, same song, second, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and with Rome comes Titus. Do you know what Titus is known for? The burning of Yerushalayim. The beautiful temple. The walls. He burned to get the gold out from between the bricks. He set everything on fire. Fire is devastating. And our people have been marched off. He's built an arch that's called an arch of triumph because he's saying this is the end of the Jews. And I want you to know that I took these little feet and I stood at that Arch of Titus with another Jewish my partner in ministry and we stood and we unfurled an Israeli flag and said, uh ah, -uh, these feet are pointed toward Yerushalayim and we're going home. We are here because our God said there will never be an end of Israel. But we're still in the diaspora to this day even though we have and hallelujah, and it's another hallelujah moment, we have the nation reborn in a day. We have the fulfillment of the prophecy of Yeshahu, Isaiah chapter 66, that said, can a nation be born in a day? I'll read it for you in a moment, but before I get there, I want you to know that yes, shalom for Israel is possible. Politically, materially, we're not seeing this yet, but we know that they're blind to their greatest hope. And that's what will bring them shalom. So even though they're back in the land, it's no wonder they don't have shalom yet. And they're not all back in the land. There's a few of us right here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there's coming a time, and it's called Yaakov's trouble, Jacob's trouble. It has to come first. In this time, they're going to see devastation that makes what I'm talking about pale in comparison. And that takes my breath away. I can hardly imagine. 
listening to the news reports on October 7th and 8th and 9th and 10th and continuing on and what we hear today, I, I can hardly take that in. And that's nothing to what God says is coming. Mm -hmm. Now, chapter 1 and verse 6, he asked, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure, endure the burning of his anger? His wrath brushes, gushes forth like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. And I look at our Hoth Torah portion for this week. And Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14 says, Can your heart endure? Or can your hands be strong for the days that I deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. And this fire, this day that God is talking about, is to cleanse the land. It is a fiery judgment. But God will bring his people through. Those who put their faith in him, those who turn to him, he will bring them through. And remember these words. Messiah. How do I say it? It's, it's of Messiah. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 10 now. His dominion will be from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. That is so poignant because of what we hear and is recorded here. In the midst of judgment, yes, that judgment is coming, but here is the end. Here is our hope. Hosea chapter 2 verse 14 says, Therefore, behold, I'm going to persuade her. I'm going to bring her into the wilderness. I'm going to speak kindly to her. I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope, and she will respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she went up from the land of Egypt. And it will come about on that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me your husband, and I will and no longer call me Baal. You'll no longer be in idolatry and false worship. You're going to come to know that you are for the believers, we are the bride of Yeshua. For Israel, she is the wife of Yehovah, the faithful God. Zechariah chapter 14 says, When the day comes, this will be written on the bells worn by the horses, on their bells of the horses. It's going to say, Consecrated to Adonai. And the cooking pots in the house of Adonai will be as holy as the sprinkling bowls, sprinkling bowls, uh, before the altar. Yes, every cooking pot in Yerushalayim and Yehuda will be consecrated to Adonai Sabaot. Everyone who offers sacrifices will come. Take them and use them to stew the meat. When that day comes, there will no longer be Canaanites, the merchants who made it something other, in the house of Adonai Sabaot. There is hope. There is the tabernacle of David that will be restored. Amos, Amos told us that in chapter 9 and verse 11. In Jeremiah 31 says, God saying it, I, it, that it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them says Adonai, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my Torah within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer will anyone of them teach his fellow community member or his brother, saying, No, Adonai, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you know what correlates with that is Habakkuk, Habakkuk in your English, chapter 2, verse 14. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. I think the seas are pretty full of water. So the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. We call that the Ha'alam Hapa, the world to come. You know what that is? Shalom! Yeah. <laughs> they finally get it. <laughs> there finally is shalom. 
The lion and the lamb will lie down together. The kings will fall down before the Lord. Remember, even the horses' bells are consecrated to the Lord. All the nations will serve him, and shalom will be known throughout the world. Yes. Can you wrap your mind around that? Wow. And I say that would be as crazy as telling a 99-year-old man that he's going to have a son if I didn't know there's nothing crazy about what my God says. Amen. I can take it to the bank. I can put my life on it, and I will not be disappointed. This is the hope of Israel. This is what I want to give Israel on Sunday. This is what I want to say to that one who has made it through Holocaust in Europe and now a Holocaust in her very own homeland called Israel. Mm -hmm. And Yermia chapter 14, 8 says it best. He says, the hope of Israel, its savior in times of distress. And Yermia chapter 17, verse 13 says, the hope of Israel, Adonai, the Lord, the hope of Israel. All who abandon you will be put to shame. He got it right. The ones who are going to lose out are the ones who abandon God. He does not abandon them. The Lord does not deny them. But when they deny him, they will miss out. Amen. They'll be as in as much anguish and more than that woman that had no hope. This is so significant that it's not just our prophets, and it's all of our prophets that say it. But God took it and recorded in the Brit Chodesha also. And Shaol, Paul, good little Jewish boy, in his imprisonment, wrote about this hope of Israel. In Acts 28 and 20, he declares what God will do. This is not a, I hope so. This is, I know so. This is guaranteed. Israel has promised that, that she's going to build cities, and she's going to live in them. Can you imagine that? She's going to build the cities and live in them. She's going to plant, and she's going to be there to reap the crop. She's never going to be uprooted again. Amos that I started with before, chapter 9, verse 11 says, On that day I'll raise up the fallen shelter, the sukkah of David, and wall up its gaps. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And the nation, all the nations who are called by my name declares, Adonai, the Lord, who does it. It goes on, it says, Behold, days are coming, and it tells how the plowman will take over the reaper, that they're going to be still trying to get in from this crop when the next crop is being planted. They're going to have so much abundance that even the mountains will drip with grain juice. Amazing. All the hills will come apart. All the hills will be singing, let me tell you. And he says, I'll restore the fortunes of my people, Israel. Rebuild their desolated cities. They'll live in them. They'll plant vineyards, drink their wine, make gardens, eat their fruit. I'll plant them in their land. And these are the most beautiful words. Because we know they've been planted in the land and they were cast out. And they were planted in the land and they were cast out. And we know that we have some that have come back, but not all. But here God says that this time they will not be uprooted again from the land which I have given them, says Adonai. They will not be moved. They will not be moved. <laughs> they will not be moved. They'll have spiritual blessings. They'll have material blessings. The greatest in, in the spiritual, remembering their sins no more. And I hear Daniel, Daniel, chapter 7. I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So we know this is the Son of God before Jehovah. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, populations, all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Israel, there's your future. We're all familiar with Yeshua, Isaiah 9, 6. All the names that are given, and we, 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 all, we pull them out, especially around the time of remembering his birth, the birth of Messiah, but we should be saying his names all, all the day long, all the year long. We shouldn't stop, but don't stop with 6, go into 7, because it says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace yes. on the throne of David 
and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal. Do you know what zeal is? The excitement of all the nights of, oh, he's excited. I'm not the only one excited. He's even more excited. And he says, the, the Adonai, Sabaoth, the Lord of the armies, the host of heaven, the host of the earth, he will accomplish this. And I hear the Lord himself saying, hallelujah. I see him rejoicing. And that's how we answer a question. How do we live now? We live with the hope of Israel. We live knowing that we can count that Omer. And remember, they brought in first fruits by faith, saying, we're going to have a great harvest in 50 days. That's what we're going to be bringing at Shavuot, is our harvest. But here's our first fruits. Here's our, our hope. And we know Yeshua rose on first fruits. First fruits. He is our hope of the resurrection of the harvest. And here we can count. And we can count looking toward that future. We're not going to count and look toward it's been, I've lost count now. It's over 200 days. It's over six months. We won't be counting those days. We'll be counting the days of rejoicing, to bring in the harvest, to celebrate, to come up to the mountain of our Lord and to give him praise. And it will go throughout the land. Hallelujah. What? What a plan. What, how beautiful it is. And this is how we do business. It's taking care of business. It's not business as usual. The Israel's hopes have been raised and dashed for millennia. Her prophets, her priests, her kings that have failed twice. She's been disobedient and thrust out of the land. She's been tortured. She's gone through relentless persecutions. She's been homeless. And yet 2,000 years out of the land, and she still remained a people. That's the faithfulness of our God, and that brought back their hopes. Now we have a homeland, and that's why this is so devastating to our people, is they felt that at least the Jew now had a land. So the Holocaust wouldn't happen, and then this strikes them. But again, this is where God said that, that she would deliver before she was in labor that she would be born in a day and a nation would be given all at once. That's the rebirth. And that spurred a utopian fever. There was such hope in the first early years. Yes, it was hard. And I remember the joke in the kibbutz that my parents were in in 1953 when Israel was just a few years old. And they said, you know, for thousands of years we prayed for this. And it had to happen to me. <laughs> but 76 years later, We've got a scenario. We've got that they've been shamed, they've been robbed, they've been despised, they've been abused, they've been murdered, they've been raped, they've been beheaded, and they're continually threatened. I, the world court wants to arrest right. Netanyahu. Right. Oh, oh. And Israel, stop. Do not defend yourself. Lay down your weapons and there will be peace. Really? Really? Israel is not going in to Rafa to be genocidal, to wipe out a people. She's going in to Rafa to wipe out terrorism, to give all the people, the Arabs and the Israelis, a chance to live and not to live in the conditions they're in now. So when will this peace come? When does Israel get this shalom? And we all know, not now, and not with what we know is coming, but after it, after it, she will. The time of Yaakov's trouble will come to an end, and Messiah, the hope of Israel, will come. It's all about the king's business, and that's what we should be all about, is yes, the king's amen. business. And that's why the words, even though they were spoken many thousands of years ago are so poignant for us today. Said to our little Jewish girl Hadassah, in the middle of a Persian empire, in a position of queen, that you've got to again say, really? <laughs> Who knows that what God put you in the kingdom for such a time as this. And that's why Shaul Paul cries out in Romans 1.16, he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation for all who would believe, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. Not meaning a better, it's just the order, because the Jew was given the oracles of God, and they were to take it to the world. 
And Hadassah had the right attitude. I will go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. We need to go. We need to go to the highways. We need to go to the byways. We need to go to the mountains. We need to go to the valleys. We need to go wherever God directs our feet. And we need to preach it. And we need to teach it. We need to tell Israel. We need to shout. Remember the shout that brought down the walls of Jericho? We need to shout and watch the walls of our enemies fall. Too many people. Oh, it's for the young ones. Abraham was 99. <laughs> Can you imagine chasing a toddler at 102? <laughs> I think he could argue with you about saying you're too old or too tired. And you may have all kinds of troubles, sores in your own lives and say, well, I can't handle that. I'm, I've got too many problems myself. Well, is there hope for Israel? Yes. yes then is there not hope for you? Yes. Isn't the same God who is faithful to Israel faithful to you? Do you really want to call him out and say, I can't do it because you're not faithful, you're not there for me, you're not... Or is this just all pie in the sky and it's just an illusion? Well, I for one, I'm going to take God at his very word. Amen. Not one word of his has ever failed in my life and in all the lives of those who put their faith in him. And God tells us to put our faith in God. And tell him Psalm 42, verse 5, he says, Why are you in despair, my soul? David was talking to himself. Why are you so despairing? And why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence. My God. Personally said, my God. And do you know how it says it in Hebrew? And this blew me away. That for the help of his presence, my God, it literally says, Yeshu Ot Panah. What it literally says is salvation or deliverance of his face. Mm -hmm. David was saying, I'm going to see his face. He is my salvation. Mm -hmm. He is my deliverer. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow, the God that has kept Israel, the God who sent Messiah, who sent him to be born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, worked miracles in Galilee, the God who worked through Judea, and who in Jerusalem alone, we see Yeshua die, but we see him raised third day. We see he ascended. We see he's sitting at the right hand of God. We know that he's waiting for the perfect time of return because God's got it all ready, planned, and it's finished. It's just unfolding for us, but it's done. Mm -hmm. Nothing can yeah. change it. And this is the one that has the power to transform our lives. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. And it will happen to Israel. He can bring you shalom if you look to him. He can bring Israel shalom. He will eventually. That's the heartbeat of Abraham. That's the heartbeat of our prophets. That's the heart that's eating in me right now. I'm so excited I can't hardly contain it. He will save Israel. And she will say on that day, see, this is our God. We waited for him to save us. This is Adonai. We put our hope in him. We are full of joy. So glad he saved us. For on the, this mountain, the hand of Adonai will rest. Amen. That's Yeshahu Isaiah 25, 9 and 10. And I'll finish with the words in chapter 26, starting with verse 1. On that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. Thomas, want to put it to music? Because it's a song. We have a strong city. He has built walls and ramparts for our safety. Open the gates. Let the righteous nation enter, a nation that keeps faith. And here's where I bring it home. A person whose desire rests on you, you preserve in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, because he trusts in you. Trust in Adonai forever, because in Yah Adonai is rock of ages. We should be living as a people with no hope, nor should Israel. Our countenance should be showing the world 
we've got something different here. We should be singing that song. We should be singing it now. This is what is coming. We have faith in the hope of Israel. If you don't know that faith, talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you how to get that faith inside your heart. And then your heart can want to explode just like mine. <laughs> but it's all about our God. It's all about the hope of Israel. And you can talk to him anytime, every time, all the time. So I'm going to tell you, pray and pray on and see the salvation of the God of Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.